quiet and still for a second. Just the gentle footfalls of a large dog. Before the cacophony of Day's song continues. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxent General. I am your host, Jess. This week, we travel around the world and back again with a family ghost story, an Austrian drink, and right back in our eye for a special local biscotti, double chocolate walnut espresso biscotti. Also, this week we are doing a reading of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat, one of our favorites. But first, we want to thank our Patreon subscribers. These bountiful people are the tomato plants and zucchini of the garden that is the Patuxent General, without whom we would be merely herbs and weeds. If you would like to join our Victory Garden, look for the Patuxent General page on Patreon or click the link in the show notes. So thank you. But for now, let's take a little trip and try Om Dudler. Erwin Klein gave the perfect wedding gift to his new bride, a soft drink that he made himself, of 32 natural alpine herbs, beet sugar, and soda water. But the details are a closely guarded secret. The most popular drink in Austria for over 55 years, so of course it has an awful lot of recipes that use it. So crack open a cold bottle and let's talk about the variations. The drink itself is similar to lemonade and served the same way. However, I have a recipe for a barbecue sauce made with Om Dudler. Mostly there are cocktails like the one I'm about to share. I got this one from the company itself and it sounds very refreshing. I'm looking forward to my taste test. For the alms mash, you will need 100 milliliters Om Dudler Original, 60 milliliters gin of your choice. There are some good Rhode Island gins out there, and one infused with elderberry would go very well. 40 milliliters rosemary, basil, or lemon syrup. 20 milliliters lemon juice. 20 milliliters grapefruit juice. Sprigs of rosemary and basil leaves. Some ice, a tall Collins glass, a mixer, and a spoon. Prepare your glass with the ice and rosemary and basil already in it. Add the rest of your ingredients to the mixer and gently stir. You don't want to lose all your carbonation. Pour into your glass and you can't help but enjoy. You know, I bet my dad wished he'd had a few of these before his overnight near the Austria-Hungary border. He and my much-loved stepmom were staying in the Gost house on the Austrian side on their way to Budapest. This Gost house was a brewery before it held people, and before that it was a monastery. My parents were traveling with friends and had a late dinner. It was later still when they walked exhausted from traveling to bed. As in many European Gost houses, the bathroom was down the hall. My stepmom went straight to bed. She was fast asleep already when the covers lifted on the other side of the bed, making her shiver. She closed her eyes only for a moment to feel my father raising the covers again. Perturbed, she says, why did you get into bed twice? My father replies, I didn't. I just came into the room. She was wide awake now. It took hours for them to relax and finally fall asleep again. What had crawled into bed with her? They never learned the answer or stayed there again. Double chocolate walnut espresso biscotti. This recipe right here is the one that everybody rolls their eyes on. Just saying the name can make some folks' mouths water. Double chocolate walnut espresso biscotti. Done correctly, it's the best cookie ever. I always include them in my holiday boxes. This calls for fresh, hot espresso, which I had at the bakery, but perhaps you don't have an espresso machine at home. I have, in a pinch, substituted strong coffee, but espresso really gives a depth that is lovely. High quality, dark cocoa, makes all the difference, as well as high quality, low wax, semi-sweet chocolate chips. The walnuts, if lightly toasted, are soft and flavorful, but the biggest secret to this recipe is sifting. Sift all dry ingredients together three times. It matters. 
air pockets dry into lighter cookies and the cocoa needs to be well integrated with the rest of the dry bits. Years ago, with the Little Falls Bakery and Cafe, we attended an event called the Taste of Patuxent Village. To be an invited table was prestigious. The owners and I worked hard to show the best of what we did. Every year, we did this biscotti, and every year it knocked it out of the park. The original had one loaf, and that made gigantic biscotti. I have found that splitting this into two loaves makes more manageable size and perfect for dunking into coffee or tea. After fully cooled, these gems store very nicely in an airtight container. That said, humidity is their enemy, so I generally do these in the cooler months. But this week it rained and then dried off, so let's make double chocolate walnut espresso biscotti. For this recipe, you will need one cup unsalted butter, softened, one cup of sugar, two shots of espresso, about four ounces, four eggs, two thirds of a cup dark cocoa, four and one half cups flour, three teaspoons baking powder, one half teaspoon salt, one and one quarter cup chocolate chips, one and one quarter cup walnuts, one quarter cup walnuts for topping, and one egg whisked for topping. So, the first thing to do is set your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit to preheat. Then cream your softened butter with your sugar until fluffy. Then, add your cooled espresso and eggs and gently beat while scraping down the sides every minute or so. Sift together three times the cocoa, flour, baking powder, and salt. Toast your walnuts gently, just until you smell them. Then add dried, sifted ingredients to the bowl, as well as the walnuts and chocolate chips. Mix gently and scrape down the sides until fully incorporated. Split into two equal loaves, three inches by 18 inches. Put them on a cookie sheet covered with parchment paper. Then tighten the loaves by pulling the parchment from each long side until both loaves are uniform and even. Then paint them with the egg wash and top with walnuts in a line down the center. Bake for 15 to 20 minutes until they have bounced back in the center. Remove them from the oven and cool for 20 minutes. Then cut the loaves at a slight diagonal, about one inch apart. Lay down on the cut side and put back in the oven for 15 minutes. Cool them for 10 minutes and then turn them over to the other cut side. Put them back in the oven for another 15 minutes. Check to see if they are fully dried but never burned. If they are ready, remove them from the oven and let cool an hour before serving or storing. After that, they store very well, unless your friends eat them all and enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. Episode 38, The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe, published 1843. For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it. In a case where my very senses reject their own evidence, yet mad I am not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they may seem less terrible than Baroque's, Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found 
which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive, in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as the feeding and caressing them. This peculiar of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early, and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity in procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black, and sagacious to an astonishing agree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, but I mention the matter at all, for no better reason than it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me wherever I went in the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when, by accident or through affection, they came in my way. But disease grew upon me. For what disease is like alcohol? And at length, even Pluto who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effect of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him. When, in his fright at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth, the fury of a demon instantly possessed me, and I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and more than fiendish malevolence, gin nurtured, thrilled through every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, and grasped the beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from its socket. <sighs> I blush, I burn, I shudder while I pen this damnable atrocity. When reason returned in the morning, when I had slept off the fumes from the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was at best a feeble, inequivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess, and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went on about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. 
I had so much of my own heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of the creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation. And then came, as to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account. Yet I'm not sure that my soul lives. Then I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart. One of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or stupid action for no other reason than because he knows he should not have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such this spirit of perverseness i say came to my final overthrow it was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cool blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it from the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes, with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew it had loved me, and because I felt it had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in doing so I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as if to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God." On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains on my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair." I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity, but I am detailing a chain of facts, and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a great compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering here, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it, with every minute and eager attention. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas-relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous, and there was a rope around the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length, reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, the garden had immediately filled with crowd by someone of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of the other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which had then with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass accomplished the portraiture that I saw. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling facts I just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented, for another pet of the same species, or somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. 
One night as I sat, half stupefied, in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object, reposing on the head of one of the immense hogshead of gin or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what caused me now surprise was the fact that I had no sooner perceived this object thereupon. I approached it, and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of his breast. Upon touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, and rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it from the landlord, but this person knew no claim to it, nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated. But I know not how or why it was, its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed me. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into a bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature, a certain sense of shame, and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, after some weeks, strike, or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence, as from the breath of pestilence. With the aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for me seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinency which would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. However, whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get in between my feet and thus nearly throw me down. Or, fastening its long and sharp claws to my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly... And let me confess this at once, the absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet it, I should be at a loss otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own to the terrors and horror with which that animal inspired in me. Had it been heightened by one of the merest chimeras, it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I had spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had, at length, assumed a rigorous distinctiveness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this above all I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself the monster if I had dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows, Ugh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and crime, of agony and death. And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast, whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man fashioned by the image of the high God, so much of an insufferable woe, alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter... I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off incumbent eternally upon my heart. 
Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole inmates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbursts of the fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife was, alas the most usual and most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs, and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which I had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But the blow was arrested by the hand of my wife, goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal. I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplish, I set myself forthwith, with an entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one point I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another I resolved to dig a grave for it in the root of the cellar. Again I deliberated about casting it into the yard, about packing it into a box, as if merchandise with usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed, and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster, with the dampness of the atmosphere preventing from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection, caused by a false chimney or fireplace, that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace it at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the whole thing up as before, so that no eye could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood, Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster, which could not be distinguished from the old. And with this I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I finished, I felt satisfied that it was all right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here at least, then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast, which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had, at length, firmly resolved to put it to death, and had I been able to meet with it at that moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept, I slept, the second and third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster, in terror, had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries were made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of police came, very unexpectedly, into the house and proceeded again to make a vigorous investigation of the premises. 
Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatsoever. The officers bade me accompany them in the search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not a muscle. My heart beat calmly, as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee in my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through a mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with the cane I held in my hand upon that very portion of brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the archfiend. No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry, at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror, half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjoined from the same throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exalt in the damnation. Of my own thoughts, it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For an instant, the party on the stairs remained motionless. Through extremity of terror and awe, in the next, a dozen stout arms were tolling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect to the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up in the tomb. Thank you again for joining us this week at the PG. If you would like to reach out to us and talk to us about your own ghost story or have any questions, uh, you can feel free to contact us at our email, jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Please reach out to us if you need any details about our recipes, would like to find out information about our pop-up general store, or have a special ghost story, we'd love to hear it. But until then... I'll meet you right back here at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production, pre-recorded in Patuxet. <laughs> <laughs>